markets, speculation, and risk. This is the Chat with Traders podcast, hosted by Aaron Fifield. What's up and welcome, ladies and gents. This is episode 195, and I'm joined by Ilan Israel Stam. Ilan's a co founder of Australian ETF manager BetaShares and a principal at VC firm Apex Capital Partners. BetaShares first began trading in 2010, and currently it manages approximately $10 billion in assets across 61 funds, all of which trade on the Australian Securities Exchange, or ASX. My idea of asking Elan to be on the podcast was really just to learn a bit more about how ETF managers operate and to delve into some of the technical aspects of ETFs too. So this isn't supposed to be like an intro to ETFs type of episode. Hopefully you'll gain some deeper insight. Included in the topics we chat about are risks for ETF managers, how ETF managers make money, the important role of designated market makers, how short and leveraged ETFs trade as intended, tips for investing in ETFs, and researchable ideas for trading in ETFs. Now, I have to say it was kind of funny listening back to this interview because we referenced BetaShares Oil ETF several times. And as we recorded this April 15th, it was before crude oil futures went negative. Uh, So following this pretty significant event, BetaShares Oil ETF actually took on a similar path to USO. USO being the largest ETF in the US with oil exposure that most of you are probably familiar with. Uh, And it took on a similar path in the sense that BetaShares also changed its underlying strategy. It went from holding the front contract to holding contracts further out the curve in order to lessen the risk of the fund blowing up. So in hindsight, (laughs) perhaps an oil ETF was not the best example to use, but nevertheless. If you are interested to know a bit more about this, I've included an article link in the show notes. Plus, Ilan also shared with me several articles that expand on a whole bunch of the topics that we cover on this episode too, all of which can be found in the show notes at chatwithtraders.com slash 195. Uh, and that is all, folks. Here is Ilan Israel Stam for episode 195. I saw an article pop up in my Twitter feed today that uh, Beta Shares, the uh, the bear ETF that you offer, uh, had the highest volume. No, what was it? The highest, yeah. uh, the most popular traded ETF during March. That's right. Yeah, that's right. It's pretty. Uh, I don't know. I was going to say that's pretty cool, but no, depends how you look at it. <laughs> no, I'm, I'd say it's quite cool. It actually traded more than Telstra did. Really? Yeah. That's crazy. Incredible, huh? What, Incredible. What were the numbers around it? Uh, it's about $2 billion, $2 billion traded for the month of March. So on some days, it was trading more than Telstra, you know, regularly. So, yeah. That's wild. Uh, big numbers, isn't it? Before BetaShares, if I understand correctly, you founded or you were co-founder in BetaShares around 2010. What were you doing before this? Yeah, so before I got involved in starting beta shares, I was actually in management consulting. So I was working for a company called the Boston Consulting Group or BCG. Um, It's a large strategy consulting firm that typically does work for CEO level uh, people in organizations, usually quite large organizations, helping them think through big strategic problems such as, you know, should we enter this country? How do we uh, properly, how do we properly go about launching this particular product? And I was spending a lot of my time in the financial services space. But before that, I'd always been entrepreneurial. So I'd always been doing entrepreneurial activities throughout my life, all the way back. From being a young kid, and I remember my brother and I set up a, uh, a little mini golf stand uh, in our backyard for the neighborhood kids to come and play. And we charged them, you know, I think 10 cents or whatever a time. So I always <laughs> had an entrepreneurial component. I, I spent some time uh, doing other bits and pieces in, of my own businesses. Um, I said I went to China actually and spent a whole lot of time uh, there where I set up a, a media oriented business. Um, but then that particular business was uh, 
built right about the time of the uh, other large crisis. We're busy recording this during the coronavirus crisis, but uh, the uh, that business of mine was built during the other large crisis, the global financial crisis or GFC. And so just at the time when I was about to essentially close the deal on a very large amount of financing or equity financing, um, the global financial crisis hit and that got pulled from under me, uh, which was not so fun. But that experience was, was very pretty instructive and helped me to think about all sorts of uh, entrepreneurial activities. And so when I came back to Australia after BCG and after the Chinese experience, I connected up with a few friends uh, that I'd known from university and we started working together and uh, that was the genesis of you know, of, of beta shares. Um, and I also still maintain an involvement in an investment company called Apex Capital Partners, which is essentially a venture capital style company that provides funding to early stage companies in and around the financial services space as well. So yeah, financial services is my main, has always been my main activity. Um, and so with those two activities, uh, beta shares was born. Um, actually, out of the out of the global financial crisis in many ways, uh, where things were changing a lot in the um, in the industry, the wealth management industry, and we saw the opportunity in in what is known as exchange traded funds, uh, which I'm sure we'll talk more about. And exchange traded funds were were growing very fast over in the U.S., um, but in Australia, when we were when we were looking at starting beta shares, it was a very small, very tiny uh, little market. I think it had about five billion dollars in total. And we decided that there was an opportunity to build out an Australian-focused specialist exchange-traded funds business, you know, really tailored to the needs of Australian investors and focused on those needs. Our competitors are, are very large global financial institutions who are incredible businesses, but don't necessarily focus only on Australia and the needs of Aussie investors. So we thought there was an opportunity. We really liked the space, the ETF space. It was a very fast-growing industry for a number of reasons. The writing was on the wall for that to continue, and uh, we thought we had the chops to be able to build out a business. And yeah, since then it's been um, it's been a good, really great great growth pathway over the last about nine years. So we started our first fund at the very end of 2010. So it's about nine nine and a half years now since we started Beta Shares. Yeah, I think you did well to foresee that the the rise of popularity in ETFs would um, come to fruition. It seems like such a big thing to take on. Like, where do you even begin when you decide that you're going to launch an ETF management company? <laughs> well, just like anything, you, you, you research the market, you understand what's involved in starting one up. You obviously have to have faith in yourself that you or your partners have got the abilities to actually build out this business. And that's important, you know, because you, it, is, it is quite a technical space. It is one that invo- does require a fair bit of knowledge about the regulatory environment, about things like the way in which funds are bought and sold and the way in which you get your funds exposed to investors of all sorts, whether they be end investors or advisor investors, etc. So we, my, my partners and I had had um, some background in financial services. It wasn't the first time we'd been looking at the space, so that helped a lot. Um, and then you, when you think about actually setting up the business, you think about what sort of business you want to be, what is your sustainable competitive advantage and um, as I said, for us, we thought that one of our big competitive advantages was that we were going to be specialists and we were going to only focus on the small country of Australia um, because um, for the other players in our space, it's a very small part of their whole map. If you think about them looking at their global portfolio, Australia is going to be a tiny part of it. But for us, we knew the space was big. The superannuation industry was large. The self-managed superannuation industry was growing. Financial advisors are a big part of the space here as well. And so we looked at all those things and, and thought that this is all coming together very nicely for what looks to be something that will, that will be a good business. And then, you know, it's all about thinking about the products themselves. So, you know, which products should we launch? But we were lucky because when we launched the, the business, there really weren't too many options out there for ETFs. There was probably 20 or so. Now there's over 200. So we had a huge amount of space to fill. And we ended up doing quite well by building out a pretty big range of funds and we've now got 61, actually. We've got 61 ETFs, and um, we're managing just over $10 billion now. So that was a great path, and a lot of it came back to the usual thing, thinking about your core competencies, thinking about what your strengths are at a, at a personal level, and thinking about where the market's headed and where, it's, you know, where it is now and where it might be headed. And all those things were very positive for the ETF industry, and I think that's coming true. So to put numbers to it, when we started 
Beta shares, there was, as I mentioned, $5 billion in assets invested in ETFs in Australia. There's now about $60 billion. So, um, and we've been lucky to be taking a good share of that growth um, every year since we've been in the market. And those 61 ETFs which you've issued, they are all trading on the ASX? That's right. Yeah. So, all of our funds are bought and sold like a share on the ASX. And so, that's what an ETF is. An ETF is a, is a, is a managed fund that can be bought and sold like an ETF. So, ETF stands for Exchange Traded Fund. So, it can be bought and sold like a, like a share. That means that you, know, you don't have to fill out any paperwork as you would any traditional managed fund. There's no minimum investment levied. By, by us, and so you can buy and sell it at any time during the trading day. And ETFs, now that we're onto the topic, are typically index tracking funds. Not always, but they're typically index tracking funds. So they typically aim to track an index, and those index indices can be of many, many shapes and sizes. But you know, a simple example, you want to get exposure to the technology sector, and everyone, most people would have heard of the NASDAQ 100. NASDAQ 100 is the largest 100 companies that are traded on the NASDAQ stock exchange in the US. And they involve all the large global technology stocks. So Google, it's now called Alphabet, but Google, Microsoft, Netflix, Amazon, Apple. So instead of going ahead and buying those individual securities, you could buy an index tracking fund, and that's what an ETF is. So we have got the NASDAQ 100 ETF, for example, the NDQ. So you buy and sell it using the ASX code NDQ. And that gives you exposure to those technology stocks. So it allows you to, to get exposure to what you want as simply as buying a share, but not necessarily only getting a single share's exposure. And, and typically, because they are index tracking funds, they're much lower cost than traditional managed funds that you would have heard about that are managed by these star investment pickers who you know, pick, pick stocks, et cetera. We typically just try to, to manage to an index. Right. So... I obviously have a lot of questions around this, uh, a lot of maybe technical questions around um, your role as, now let me just get this correct before we proceed too much further. Calling you an ETF manager, is that the right term? Like what, what is beta shares exactly? Like yeah, what's the right terminology? Yeah, that's right. So we are a fund manager that okay. specializes in exchange traded funds or ETFs. That's the exact terminology. Okay, cool. So let's get started on this. Let's let's get down into the the nitty gritty. Um, one of the first things I wanted to bring up with you around this is talking a little bit about risk. So your role as an ETF manager, and I guess you can sort of partially speak for any ETF manager really, what risks are you vulnerable to in the position of a manager? Yeah, so... To clarify again, we are the fund manager of the exchange traded funds. We manage 61 of them at the moment. Uh, they are of all shapes and sizes. So they're not only share oriented or equities oriented ETFs. We've got bond ETFs. We've got cash ETFs. We've got shares that we've got ETF that's got ETFs that aim to provide you exposure to the gold price. We've got ETFs to provide exposure to the crude oil futures price. We've got funds that are aimed to actually go up when the market comes down which are the short, the short funds that we have. So that's our role. Our role is to, is to allow investors, we essentially are creating investment tools for investors to basically back their view or, or take a view on whatever it is that we're providing that exposure to. So what we don't aim to do, unlike perhaps other fund managers who have come on your show or fund managers that your listeners would be familiar with, we don't try to outperform a particular index like the ASX 200 necessarily. We, 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 as the fund, we as the ETF provider are the ones that are putting together these investment products for you to use for your own portfolios. So in terms of risks, to be honest, there's no specific extra risks that we would be exposed to as an ETF manager um, above and beyond the risk of any other um, fund manager. And for that matter, as an investor in an ETF, there's also no extra risk that you take on um, investing in an ETF beyond the risk you take on investing in in the ETF itself or fund itself. So for us, um, what makes our business tick is is the funds under management. So we get paid a very, you know, often a very modest fee for for every dollar that we have under management. That's what makes our business tick. So risk-wise for us, frankly, um, not a huge amount. Um, it's all about for the investors, the movement in the underlying investments, which will cause the risks. So of course, you know, if you choose to track 
to invest in products that are very volatile, uh, you know, where the underlying index is very volatile or, for example, you know, take, for example, the current market. We're, we're recording this in the middle of, of April 2020. The current market, the crude, the crude oil world is, is, is going nuts. You know, oil, oil prices was below $20 at one point. So that's a highly volatile. So therefore, you're going to have risk on that particular investment. But simply, that's the, the investment choice you have made. Or, for example, if you use geared, some of the geared funds we have, you get much more risk associated with being in a geared position. But, but no, there's no additional risk as such that we are responsible for or that we are vulnerable to. And so, no, I think that that would be the way I'd answer that question. You don't need to look at us any differently from any other fund manager you may have spoken to. So, I might just rephrase that question a little bit. I guess it's a slightly different question, actually. But as the manager, to what extent are you concerned about the ETF price? You know, let's just pick on uh, the oil example, which you spoke about. So, obviously, as a trader or investor, someone who buys, you know, goes long that ETF, which has exposure to oil, uh, if that goes down in price, then obviously that's uh, not ideal. But as a manager, someone like yourself, if the the price of that ETF or the price of oil uh, decreases further, uh, w- what sort of position does that put you in? Are you at an advantage or disadvantage either way? We're not really at an advantage or disadvantage either way. Ultimately, we need to make sure that our funds are providing you as an investor with the objective that we have set out. So in the case of the the, the crude oil futures product, it gives you exposure to the price of crude oil futures. If the price of the crude oil futures goes down, then it should be expected by the investor. And we expect that, that the, the share, the unit price or the ETF price will go down. So we, the only reason why we would mind as such is because, because it means that if the asset value goes down, then so too does our assets under management. But again, that's just the nature of being in the market. We don't, we can't control that. So all we can control is making sure that the investor gets what they are after. And if they have chosen to invest in oil and the price of oil has fallen, then obviously they should not be upset to know that the ETF price would fall. That's that's what they've signed up for. And we need to make sure that we're providing that exposure. And then on the other hand, we just need to make sure that these products do what they say on the tin. And, and that's that's what we really spend our time thinking about. So um, we're not... We can't control that. We can control the fact that we want people to invest in our funds. And so, of course, we're out there educating the market and whether that be financial advisors or end investors about ETFs. And clearly, we want to get people to invest in, in ETFs as an industry. But we do that because we think that it is really, for most investors, a very sound way to get started in the investment industry. And indeed, even if you're not a beginner, to trade your view of a particular um, of a particular exposure. Okay. So, have you felt any adverse impacts from this recent market downturn? Actually, we have not had any adverse impacts. We are um, we are very diversified as a business. As mentioned before, we've got sixty one funds, and um, importantly, it's as I said before, those funds do not only cover shares. So they do not only cover shares. As a result of that. Um, we've got bonds, we've got cash. So what generally that means is that just like having a very diversified portfolio, almost independently of the market conditions, there will be something that does well and there'll be something that does less well. Our business is like a microcosm of that. Um, and um, so as a result of that, we have, of course, seen pretty significant falls in the value of our share-oriented funds. But at the same time, we've had other products such as the ones that go up when the market goes down that have risen, risen tremendously in value. So we are ultimately in a pretty similar position that we were before this all started. Um, and most importantly of all, our funds have been able to do what they said they were going to do. And that's really what we care most about. They've been able to give people those exposures. Whether those exposures are positive or negative, they have done what they were sort of produced to do in the first place. Yeah. So because the big thing for you is the amount of uh, the assets under management you've probably seen some money shifting out of some products, but because you have so many to offer, that money flows into other products instead of just um, being pulled out altogether. That's exactly right. And in particular, you know, given the current market environment, I will repeat, you know, we're in the middle of March, 2020, depending on when somebody comes to listen to this, things were, you know, 
we're in lockdown mode at the moment. And so hopefully by the time somebody comes back to this and re- listens to it in, in a few months' time, we won't be. But, um, you know, as a re- in particular, we have seen people selling out of fixed income and buying into equities. Uh, people seem to be thinking, in particular with Australian equities, actually, we've been seeing our Australian equities funds being bought fairly heavily and our fixed income funds being sold down. Okay, interesting. Now, just to pick up on that point of assets under management being a big thing for uh, your business, can you just explain that a little more? Like, why is that um, key to your source of revenue? Well, the way in which an ETF manager uh, earns a living Mm -hmm. is to take a fee for funds under management. So essentially what happens is there's a fee that ranges dramatically depending on what the particular ETF is, where every day out of the unit price, there will be a tiny amount that comes out in the form of a fee. So that is a way in which an ETF manager exists. That is the, the essentially the reason for, for um, that is the way in which the, the revenue line of an ETF manager actually operates. So that is why. So if there is more funds under management, then each of those, obviously, there'll be more fees to, to collect. If there's less, there'll be less fees to collect. So that's, that's the reason. Now, how does a trader or an investor actually see those fees? Well, that's the good thing. It, it, they don't. It just, it just comes out, you know, if let's say the fee was 10, we call it basis points, the 0.10% for the year. That means that every day, 10 divided by 365, 10 basis points divided by 365 being the number of days would come out of that of that unit price, so it's pretty much undiscernible to to an investor. Um, they don't actually have to pay it; it just comes out of the of the unit price every day. I'd love to ask you a few questions around the holdings. So, actually, understanding uh, how you manage the underlying assets or underlying securities of the ETFs that you provide. So. As a manager, how do you decide when to add or remove securities from an ETF? And maybe it might be helpful for you know th- these lines of questions if we pick an example. So if we maybe focus on your oil or your gold ETF, I presume with your oil or even your gold ETF, it might own like sort of 50 different uh, gold companies, public, publicly traded gold companies. Uh, as well as maybe some exposure to the actual commodities. Is that right? So it's not quite right. So essentially, um, again, with 61 different funds, we have a whole range. So the gold, we have a gold bullion fund, and literally that owns gold bullion. It actually owns physical hard gold in a vault um, in London. So obviously in that case, there's no decisions about taking out any securities. It's just it's just gold. That's all we're doing. We, we're providing you with exposure to gold. That's called QAU, that one. You get exposure to the price of gold. That one has a currency hedge over it, so you don't have to worry about the price of US dollars versus the Australian dollar. So that is that one, it couldn't be more simple in a way. We just basically buy as much gold as people have invested in the fund. We, on the other hand, to use continue with the theme on gold, we do have a gold miners ETF, and that's um, MNRS, as it turns out. That's the name of the ASX code for that one. So that one, does own the world's largest gold miners companies, um, gold mining companies. So it's an ex-Australia fund. So it doesn't include Australian gold miners. It includes gold miners excluding Australia. And that now this will give give us an answer to your question. So the as I mentioned before, the vast majority of ETFs track an index. So when we talk about the gold miners ETF and what we are you know what we are buying there, we are buying the underlying gold mining companies that are part of an index. And in that case, it's an index that's created by, by a provider. That particular index is created by a provider. NASDAQ, NASDAQ's got an index business and they've got a series of uh, indices that track gold mining companies. And so we actually, again, do not make the decision as to when, as to which particular gold miners to buy. We track that index in its entirety. So what that means is that these indices often do what's known as a rebalance. So that could be an annual or quarterly or semi-annual rebalance. And that is the time in which we, given that we are trying to track that index, we will buy and sell those particular, uh, those particular securities to, to be in line with the underlying index. So 
Maybe to a much simpler example, an example that people will understand, the ASX 200. The ASX 200, we've got a fund that has exposure to the largest 200 companies on the ASX. It's called A200. So what do we do? We basically will buy all those 200 companies that are part of the ASX 200 index. That ASX 200 index will rebalance itself regularly. I believe it might be, it might be quarterly in that particular case. What will happen is that companies that are no longer part of the largest 200 companies will, will move out of the index. Companies that have grown and have become part of the 200 index will enter the index. And we essentially will make those same trades on that day of the rebalancing. So those, that is the way in which we decide, and we don't actually decide, I guess the point is there isn't any discretion, what goes into that particular product. So it's, it's more like we are um, acting on a set of rules set by an index provider, and we are providing that back to you as an investor. So you don't have to rebalance, you don't have to go through the list of the top 200 and decide uh, what, um, you know, what is right and what is wrong. We will essentially do that for you, and we will take care of all that trading. Okay, so just so I understand correctly, across the 61 products that you offer, there's no real decision making from your part as to what the underlying securities are. That's right. The decision making on our part on the passive funds, and I'll come back to one, one, quick, one quick issue on that. On the passive funds, the decision that we make is A, which product to launch and then which index we should be tracking. And at times, we will even help create that index. But once, that, once those index rules have been created and it's published by a third party, our role in those passive funds is to, is to provide access to those, particular, to those particular companies. Now, in saying that, we do have a range of active ETFs by which there is somebody making a decision about what to buy and what to sell. But we do not, as it turns out, we do not make those decisions ourselves. In those cases, we have partnered with a third party fund manager. And that fund manager will be the one who makes the decisions. And in that case, we are providing investors with an actively managed portfolio where somebody is making those decisions. Um, and we are providing that to them in the ETF form or the ETF wrapper. Okay. Okay. Understood. When you do uh, rebalance, let's say the ASX 200 index, uh, the ETF which tracks that, when you uh, rebalance your exposure to the underlying securities at the end of each quarter, how are you executing those trades? Like, are you trading throughout the day or are you mo- doing most of this in sort of the pre or post market match? It'll be at the end of market. It'll be the end of day. I will be trading at, typically at the end of day. And we've got a portfolio management team whose role it is to do that. And they, they would do it typically at the, at the end of the day. And how do you determine how much of the underlying securities to hold on your book? So, again, let's just stick with this example of the ASX 200 here. Right. How do you decide, you know, how many shares of BHP you need to hold, how many shares of Rio, Westpac, et cetera? Yeah, okay. So, that is, that is a result of what is known as the sort of the index methodology or the index rules. So, uh, taking the ASX 200, and it's a simple, nice I think, good and simple example, the way that particular index is set up is that it is based on the market cap of those 200 stocks. So essentially, it is the largest 200 stocks weighted, we call it weighted by their market cap. So that, you know, we will, we will, the calculation is done to say that, and I'm looking at it today, uh, yesterday, turns out that CSL, because of how everything's been going in the healthcare space, is, is the largest company on that ASX 200. And let's say that CSL has a 10% weight. Out of the 200 companies, if you look at their market cap, CSL represents 10% of the weight of those total 200 companies. So we will simply just buy, we, do, we know how much we've got invested in our, in our ETF. We will simply make sure that we have 10% of that invested in CSL. And then we'll go down the list, Commonwealth Bank of Australia, 7%, BHP, 6%, et cetera, et cetera. So we will essentially be using the weighting methodology that has been created by the index provider to decide how much to buy. And in this case, it's simply market cap. In other cases, there's a variety of different things you can use to decide those weightings. So you could use an equal weight if you wanted to, or you could use uh, weights based upon you know, the fundamental values of a company, or you could use weights based upon a scoring methodology. And again, with 61 different funds, we've got a variety of different ways in which we do that. But, but typically, 
market cap still is the most used, the used weighting methodology. Okay, so just simple numbers here. Let's say you had $1 million invested in your ASX 200 ETF at the end of the quarter, mm-hmm. and the guidelines were 10% to be invested in CSL. So you would buy $100,000 worth of CSL, essentially. Well, it'd be, uh, that's right. That's right. Okay. That's exactly right. Yep, that's what we would do. And we would you know, make sure that that is um, where it goes. At the rebalance date, we would make sure that if, if CSL had a 10% weight, we, we, we had made sure that we had 10% or, in that case, $100,000 of our portfolio in CSL. Now, during the quarter, obviously, as it's trading each day, um, the funds under management for that particular ETF is increasing and decreasing. Yeah. Do you then, are you then required to increase your holdings uh, throughout the quarter or decrease your holdings throughout the quarter? Yes, of course. So, so if, if the ETF is growing in value, we'll have to obviously buy more shares, but we're still going to be buying them in the proportions that are, that the proportions associated with that index weight. So, so we'll still be following the index weights. We'll just be buying more depending on how much money it is. So we're always provide, we're always buying the same amount prorated across those um, prorated across those weights. And of course, the index weights themselves will change day by day because the share prices are changing all the time. So we just make sure we're following that index methodology carefully. And how often are you, I guess, trading to keep the market cap correct? Well, every time that every time that somebody, um, every time that our that our, our our ETF grows in value, and that can happen, that can happen every day. We will be trading more securities to 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 make sure that we have got the right amount of percentage weight given our prevailing funds under management. Okay, so it, would that just be something you do at the end of the day? It is. Okay, gotcha. Typically, yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And what about creating new units or shares like of the ETF, how does that bit work? Yeah, great. So we haven't spoken about the fact that ETFs have got two markets. Well, I'm going to just get a little bit technical, but I'll try and keep it as simple as possible. So the when you or an investor, end investor, is, is, is looking at their ComSec screen or the interactive brokers or whatever they use to, to invest, um, that is known as the secondary market. So you are essentially out there buying and selling units on the so-called secondary market. You're buying and selling those units either from another ETF investor themselves or from a market maker. So market makers are a pretty important part of the ETF ecosystem. And in many ways, uh, you know, they are critical to the, to, the, to the running of ETFs and at the same time, part of their success. Because the market maker is, is, a, is an institution, and I think you may have even, uh, if I'm not mistaken, may have spoken to some in the past, on your program, uh, is an institution who is, is there to create liquidity or to create buy and sells and depth in the ETF industry. And they make their money from taking a tiny little clip of every time somebody buys or sells from them. So they don't mind whether they're being bought from or sold from, they just want to make a trade. They're all about volume. And so they, um, in order to launch an ETF, you have to have a market maker a dedicated market maker, and typically we have many more than one, that is there to be able to be ready to buy and sell from an end investor at any time during the trading day. And so as I mentioned before, when you are trading as an ETF investor, you are buying or selling either from another fellow ETF investor or a market maker. And that means the reason that's important is that those market makers are are there to provide the liquidity to allow you to buy and sell anytime you want during the trading day. And they also are there to, to ensure that the price that you have is, you know, are being bought or sold to is close to the underlying fair value of that ETF. So um, to get back to it, that is, the, that is what we call the secondary market. Now, the primary market is, is us. We are trading not with end investors, but with a small number of large institutional players these are the big guys that you would have heard of, the Deutsche Bank, the Morgan Stanleys, the Goldman Sachs, et cetera, who have become what are known as authorized participants, but essentially they are institutional brokers. And they are the ones who will, uh, are, are there to essentially, um, to essentially create these units, create these units from us. So let me give you an example. 
if they, let's take for example, back to that ASX 200 fund. If there is more demand than, they, they, they are sitting there, when, when they started the fund, they created, they said to us, we would like to become an authorized participant for you. And as a result of that, we would like to start with, let's say, $10 million of, um, of A200 units. And we're going to be on the market buying and selling those units throughout the trading day. Now, if there is more demand than there is supply, or if the demand is increasing, at the end of the day, that particular market maker, market maker will say to us, hey, we know that we're going to need more of this. So we need to create more units. We need to create more units. They will essentially say, we need to create more units. Here's the money. We, we, know, there's, we know that we're going to have this demand because we've had a whole lot of investors um, buying from us. Here's the money. We, we, we will take that money. We will go ahead at the end of the day and buy those 200 shares. And then we'll essentially pass on a package of units in A200 back to those market makers so that the next day they can start trading them on the screen again. And so this is what's called an open-ended fund. And the reason why it's really important is because it means that it doesn't matter how many people are buying or selling. That doesn't affect the price of the ETF on any given day. What matters is just the fact that there is a market maker there who is able to, whenever they want, create more units and at the same time redeem units if, for example, supply is more than demand or if there's people, a lot of people are selling, not buying. So that's, that is how we essentially grow the ETF. That is how we create new units in the ETF. It's sort of invisible in many ways to the end investor. All they see is that there's more, there's more units on, on issue than there were before, before that. But from, from the perspective of the um, ETF industry, it's a critical part of the, of the proper functioning of the ETFs themselves. So the number of units uh, available, not available, but uh, which consist of an ETF, is that generally always governed by the market maker? No, the, the number of ETFs, number of ETF units is really governed by the demand, the demand. So when an ETF launches, it, it may launch with a very small amount of, amount of units. It could be as little as, you know, five, two, three, four, five million dollars. We get, we get it started. But that next day, that very first day, if there's a whole lot of trading in that ETF, then quite simply that, that market maker could go ahead and create more units. We take the, but as I mentioned before, we take those funds, we buy the underlying shares, we pass on these units, and then lo and behold, there might be double the number of units that second day. So that's what drives the number of units outstanding is, is essentially demand for, for, that particular, for that particular exposure. I'm glad you brought up the point about uh, the market makers because that is something I wanted to ask you about. Could you just speak to that relationship a little bit more like, let's say you are launching a new product. I presume one of the things which is very important is uh, having the liquidity. Do you like contract a market maker to, you know, support this product or how does that work or yeah, that's, that's, that's essentially right. So first of all, I will say that you're right. When we're thinking about building a new product, first of all, we obviously go through a very detailed process to think about whether to launch it in the first place. We take all sorts of information from around the world, what investors are telling us, what our sales team is telling us, what's happening in the unlisted fund space, what's happening overseas. And, um, and obviously, we need to make sure that we think we can sell it and that there's going to be demand for it. But once that's all done, we actually make liquidity very, very central to our effort because the whole point of ETFs is that the, the T in ETF is tradable, right? ETF, exchange traded fund. So there's no point creating a fund if it can't be sort of easily bought and sold um, by either the end investor or the market maker. So we, we think very carefully about that. And you are 100% right that the way in which we get one started, an ETF started, once we've designed it, come up with the index, chosen an index, set the fees, et cetera. Once we've, once we've done all that, we absolutely do make sure that there will be at least one, but typically multi-market makers who are signed on as official market makers for those, for those funds. So they do actually sign a market maker agreement so that we know they will be there to offer liquidity. And the only reason they would do that is because they have got a way, first of all, they need to sort of think that that particular ETF is going to is going to trade well, and that means they make some, some, some money on that. And also, they need to make sure that it's going to be liquid um, so that when they're out there sell it, sort of offering, offering units to the market or offering prices to the market, they can adequately hedge themselves on the back end. And they can't do that if the actual underlying exposure is, is very illiquid. So 
we do have great relationships with these market makers and we spend a lot of time fostering those relationships. In fact, we would say it's a source of competitive advantage for us. Um, we keep we keep up with them all the time. We have a large number of relationships. We during the trading day are making sure they're doing what they say they're doing. And if they're not, we'll give them a nudge to say, hey, listen, looks like you could do a bit better or you could bring the price in a bit or you could increase the volume. So that market maker relationship is critical. And you're 100 percent right that you really can't start a an ETF without a market maker relationship to begin with. And what are some of the things which you might stipulate with a market maker? So they might need to be, you know, the spread can only be so wide or they must be quoting, you know, 90% of the time or like what are some of the things which you specify with a market maker? Yeah, so there's a, there's a list of rules that are designated by the ASX. So those are the basic rules. They, they stipulate that you have to exactly that. You have to be on screen X percent of the time. You have to keep spreads which is the difference between the buy and the sell price to a certain level. I'm sure being a trading oriented podcast, you'll be familiar with, with spreads. So those types of things. But in practice, we actually go a lot further than that. And we, we ask them in particular what sort of a spread they think they're going to be quoting. And that's incorporated in our, in our, in our discussions with them. So, you know, there's usually this minimum threshold, but we always try to bring it in a lot more. Um, and, and you'll see that across the board, really in Australia, those market makers are doing a pretty good job. You now they are providing very, very tight spreads around the NAV, and um, they are on screen most of the time, if not all the time. And and so those are the types of things we think about when talking with and dealing with market maker. How do you ensure products such as your short and your leveraged ETFs work as intended? And what I mean by that is, okay, so we've got the ASX two hundred ETF. Uh, there's also a short version of that. So if someone buys that, it's it's supposed to track the ASX 200 bit inverse. Yeah. So that fu- those funds you're referring to are, are our short, short range of funds. And they're, they're the ones that we were talking about before that have been insanely, insanely popular in this recent time period. As I said, we saw um, in, as, as you said, you know, one of those funds, which is BBOZ, which is a leveraged short fund over the ASX 200 has um, you know had recorded you know by far the largest amount of trading out of any ETF in Australia in the month of March of 2020. So that was the the two billion dollars. So um, first of all, let's just discuss a little bit about those funds, how they actually are made, because I think that will help answer the question. Sure. So how they are made, and there is a difference between the ones that are short and the ones that are long. So firstly, and first and foremostly, let's start with the short funds. I know that. There's probably a good number of people that listen to this podcast that have come across those funds. They are the, the beta shares bear suite of funds, the most popular of which is that one you mentioned, the, the BBOZ and bear. The difference between them is that bear is an unleveraged short and BBOZ is a leveraged short product. Um, so that's the difference. So those funds aim to provide uh, to provide a negatively correlated exposure to the ASX 200. So they're not aimed, they don't aim to be directly inverse, and I'll explain why. They aim to be, on a, a, on a given day, they aim to be inverse, inverse to a particular range. So the bear fund, on any given day, looks to be provide a short exposure that is between negative, or basically 90 to 110%. So negative, negative 9 negative 0.9 to 1.1 of the ASX 200. Whereas the leveraged short fund, the BBOZ fund, is a, is a leveraged fund, as I said, and that aims to be leveraged short to a range of negative 200 to negative 275%, so 2.75 and 2. Um, so that's their purpose. So people shouldn't expect them to be one for one over long periods of time. That's a daily, that's a daily, it's a sort of a daily objective. Now, how they work, is actually relatively simple um, for those who understand what futures are. We are essentially shorting the futures uh, that are associated with a particular exposure. So we've, with the bear, Australian bear funds, BBOZ and bear, we are shorting ASX 200 futures. For the BBUS fund, which as it sounds is a US exposure, we're shorting the S&P 500 futures. And in relation to the gearing, the way in which we deal with that, that's just a question of our position sizing. So we're just making sure that on any given day, that particular exposure is, is, is in line with that gearing ratio. So that's, that's, that's how they're made. Um, and look, for those funds, 
they they do what they say that they're going to do because because it's a very straightforward it's, it's a very straightforward thing for us to do. We're simply just buying the uh, we're shorting those spy futures, uh, you know, at a, at that particular range, negative nine to one point one. And the way that it works is that uh, in order to keep things in range, because we have a range like that, what we try to do is if on any give, we 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 let the exposure run, and if on any given day that exposure goes above or above or beyond that threshold that I mentioned, we will rebalance back to the middle point of that exposure. We'll rebalance back. Now that typically doesn't actually happen all that often, except in very volatile markets like now. And the reason we do that is because if you don't do that, your leverage can go can get out of control. And essentially the whole point of these funds is to allow investors to invest knowing that they can't lose more than their initial capital. Unlike CFDs and other things where you can, you know, you can receive margin calls or you can lose more than you've put in. These products are not meant to be to act in that way. They're meant to be exposures that you do not have to worry about getting any margin calls. And they're also exposures for at any at any given time an investor can come in and know what their existing um, what their existing leverage is and what their existing exposure level is. So that's that's how those funds are created, the short funds. And if you'd like, I can talk about the long geared funds as well. Uh, well, just before we do that, yeah. And, and forgive me if you've partially already explained this, but yeah. So the the long, just the the regular uh, ASX two hundred ETF. Let's say the uh, the underlying futures go up one percent, then we'd expect that the ETF also goes up one percent. Correct. Yes, that's right. Yeah, the ASX two hundred ETF that doesn't use futures at all. That just is actually buying the shares actually buying the shares so there's no futures there they're just which is the reason why it will literally go up at that point um less the less this very small fee that i mentioned before of course okay yeah so in the case of the inverse etf or the short etf yes uh the underline for that you are short the futures that's right uh so if the asx 200 goes up one percent then we'd expect the inverse etf to go down one percent yeah, well, to go down between 0.9 to 1.1%. Okay. So, but my question is, how do you control that? I mean, sure, you hold the underlying assets, but the price is ultimately governed by traders who are in the market right at that point in time. Like if someone is is buying it up or, or selling it, that's moving the price. How do you make sure that price is in line with the underlying asset? Well, simply because we are also owning that underlying asset, we're just shorting it. So, so it's it's mechanical, isn't it? So, if it doesn't matter what the underlying ASX ASX two hundred does, if we're shorting that future, then we will then we will provide you know a negative version of that uh, a negative version of that on that day at that at that particular amount. So, if the ASX two hundred was to go up as it has been, sort of you know sort of go up you know sometimes in a very large way, like five percent, because because a whole lot of people have been sort of buying Aussie shares, then so too should our ETF be expected to go down by around about 5% on that given day. But is there a chance that the ETF won't? Like what if someone is in there and they're doing something crazy and they've, uh, I'm just going to rack my brain to think about which side. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's say the market is going up. So the short ETF should be coming down. Yep. Let's say someone has just got a lot of bids stacked, huge. They could essentially stop the the ETF price from moving down 1% to be the direct inverse of what the actual market's doing. Right. Are you talking about if a whole lot of people are buying in, uh, sort of putting a whole lot of bids stacked on the ETF itself? Yes. Okay. So that comes back to the fact that um, buying and selling of the underlying ETF has no impact on the price of the ETF. Um, so that's the important thing to understand. It's not like a, a company where, you know, if there's a whole lot more buyers than there are sellers, then the price of that company will go up. And that's because of that open-ended nature that I mentioned. So the, the fact that it's open-ended means that there's, there's no relationship between how many people are buying the ETF and the price of that ETF. It is, it is simply the underlying price of the security. In this case, it's a short, short security, but it really doesn't change the fact it's that particular underlying security price that's, that's changing the market. You can't game that. Um, you can't game that because these are, um, you know, these are essentially uh, instruments that are open-ended. 
So um, if somebody was to if somebody was to put a crazy you know a, a crazy price in there, it just simply wouldn't you know it just simply wouldn't be hit by that market maker. Um, it just couldn't be hit by that market maker. So so that is the whole that's the whole I guess uh, key of an ETF is that it is open ended, and that open ended nature means that um, you can be quite sure that the price of the ETF is not in any way being affected by the buying and selling of the underlying uh, but you know by the buying and selling by the individual investors in that price interesting okay i think that answers my question yes because it's it's so it's different to a stock where if someone has a humongous bid at a certain price then the market's going to struggle to get below that price a little bit until enough sellers are willing to push through it yeah so that doesn't it doesn't work like that at all and i said that, that, that's because of the fact that it's open ended because of the fact that those market makers are there and um they just there's just no way to manipulate that 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 price by yeah, under using the etf otherwise it would be one of the easiest games in town isn't it so that's um that's the way in which those particular those particular products work gotcha okay okay very very interesting I'd often wondered about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the important thing to understand is that there's open-ended. Again, a lot of investors don't understand that that the amount of bids and offers, et cetera, that you see on the screen, and, and for that matter, the amount of volume that goes through the ETF on any given day is just the tip of the iceberg. If we wanted to, somebody could go and buy. Essentially, the amount of liquidity in that ETF is only bound by the liquidity of the underlying securities, which in the case of the S&P 500 or the SPY futures is essentially very, very, very close to limitless. Um, so uh, that open-ended nature is the key difference between an ETF and a share. Uh, and that really means that, as I said before, those underlying prices are, are, are really only focused on the underlying security prices, not the buyers and sells. Okay. Yep. I'm with you. Great. Now, when we talk about, you've mentioned it a couple of times, you have like an ETF which will track the NASDAQ 100. How does the NASDAQ 100 ETF, which is provided by BetaShares, which trades on the Australian market, how does that track the NASDAQ 100 in the US when the hours don't align? So the thing about the NASDAQ 100, for example, is that there's, 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 there's 20, essentially 24-hour futures prices on the NASDAQ 100. So while, and this is the case for any uh, international ETF, whether offered by beta shares or for that matter, any other group in the world, um, the way in which the market maker, once again, will set the prices of those international ETFs is by, by reference to the futures prices, which are live and which still take into account Know, the last day's trading and anything else that comes that comes into the into the um, into people's minds uh, after market in the U.S. and that's why you know it can it can actually sometimes reflect pricing that things that haven't happened yet in the U.S. You know, for example, if something was released after market, for example, so it's actually quite a straightforward way um, in which in which those particular uh, sh units in ETFs are, pri are priced. That doesn't matter no matter which uh, international ETF you're looking at. It will it will use futures for providing the bid and offer prices to investors. Right. Uh, just one other thing, actually two more things before we close this out. You often see numbers thrown around in headlines uh, referring to inflows and outflows of ETFs. Yeah. Can you just explain that bit, please? Yeah. So I think people are interested in that because, so what that means, first of all, just to answer your question, what that means is how much, so inflows and outflows really is how much net buying and net selling there are in the ETFs. That's that's actually the um, reaction by investors rather than the you know the market the market movements. So it's independent of the market movement is how much people are buying this particular product and how much people are selling this particular product in dollars. And that's what inflows and outflows means. And I think the reason why people are quite interested in those is because they can be a really good way to gauge to know to gauge sentiment you know for example if we are seeing as we are a whole lot of people buying into our short funds as i said that two billion dollars in the month of march that indicates to people the reason why that's reported a lot is because that indicates to people that there's a fair bit of bearishness around in many ways it's one of the best ways to get a view on you know at, at quite a at quite a sort of granular level, what people are thinking. So in the same could be said for when we see people reporting that there's been a whole lot of flows into, let's say, the infrastructure sector ETF or 
the resources sector ETF or a whole lot of outflows in the European ETF, what that essentially tells investors is that, hey, broadly speaking, there's a view out there that is bearish on, for example, Europe, whereas it's, let's say, a whole lot of people are buying, I don't know, healthcare ETFs. Well, that means that healthcare stocks are in, you know, are in vogue. So it's a way that people are increasingly using because ETFs are becoming to be such a big part of the environment now. They're increasingly using those flows to, to indicate sentiment and to get a view on what, you know, what people are thinking in the investing world. Okay, so that's kind of the main use for understanding that bit is just to get a bit of a gauge on the, the market sentiment. I think market sentiment and also just what's popular and what's not. So I mentioned that there was a whole lot of inflows into Australian shares ETFs uh, in March, whereas before there was a whole lot of inflows into fixed income. So that tells you that there's at least a view out there by some people that it might be worth buying Australian shares. And um, because it's done in that in that sort of broad format, rather than sort of thinking about, hey, should I buy BHP or, or CBA? It sort of indicates that there's a sentiment out there that says there might be an opportunity to buy the dip. So I think I think that's right what you said. It is it is largely about sentiment. Right. Now, just one last question before I let you go. Uh, ETFs are often uh, marketed as being a good investment tool. What are some tips for someone who is investing mainly in ETFs for the long term? So I know a lot of the things we've spoken about here kind of relate to trading and sort of more of the technical part. Um, but just for anyone who's also interested in investing for the longer term, you know, might have a 30-year horizon, et cetera, what are some tips you would give to someone before they, um, you know, put some money into a few ETFs? Yeah, well, first of all, the, the fact that there's so many ETFs, the fact that there's so many types, shapes, sizes, we've spoken about long, we've spoken about short, um, I should just say that even though most people will view ETFs as, as, as great long-term investments, and I think they really are, they are also really interesting ways to trade views because essentially, given all those things I've mentioned, and I haven't even mentioned half of it, what's available, there's currency ETFs, et cetera, et cetera, you can express a huge number of trading views of any sort, whether it's like a relative value trade or whether you're taking a particular sector view into account or a long and short pairs trade, you can do all that via ETFs. We haven't even mentioned the fact that you can – take particular sector bets if you wanted to, you know, let's say you really like the cybersecurity sector or the technology sector so or the gold sector. So you can definitely do a lot of trading. But to get back to your question, you're right that at the heart, the vast majority of people who are getting started in investing uh, look to ETFs as a way to, to, gen to generate long-term wealth. And I think if you're looking to do that, they're obviously a very good way to do that because they're very low cost. And the tips are, Really, to not to keep things simple, pick a few building blocks that are typically highly diversified, low in cost, and stick with those and add to those. So, if you're in it as a long term investor and not a trader, then the very opposite applies. You don't want to over trade, you want to just incorporate broad building blocks for, let's say, global shares, some Australian shares, perhaps adding some bonds for diversification benefits. And with a few with a few with a few easy trades, you'll basically have a highly diversified portfolio right there. Because if you think about it, you'd have 200 stocks in the Australia. You buy a global shares ETF that could be many many thousands of ETFs. You add a few bonds in there. All of a sudden, with three trades, you might have 12, 1500 things that you're exposed to. So you're super diversified. Um, and so the tip is to keep it simple like that. Add over time, wherever possible, and stick with it. So don't let things like the current environment force you to sell. You're not, you don't need to be a forced seller. The only people that, that should be selling right now are those that for some reason need to or are trading it. If you are actually looking to generate long-term wealth, then sticking to it in a simple, low-cost way and adding to it over time is super valuable. And the other way is obviously just make sure that you do things like your DRPs, your distribution reinvestment plan. So every time there's a distribution, you reinvest that rather than taking it out. And over time, you'll generate wealth that way. And finally, it's always good to invest in things you understand as well. And that's why, for example, we've seen a whole lot of people buy things like the NASDAQ because people understand Apple and they understand Amazon and they understand Facebook and they understand Google. So 
so those would be the tips I would I would say for those people that are long term investors. Don't get too hung up on short term fluctuations. Build a core, and then once you've built a nice core, then perhaps you can start playing around on the satellites with more thematic, uh, you know, more esoteric ideas. But the point is, you've still got that great core that is growing with you and and essentially generating that long term wealth for yourself. As you mentioned it, I guess I'd better ask you. Trading some relative value types of strategies using ETFs, trading relationships, that sort of thing. Are there any ideas you might just want to leave some listeners with? You know, ideas that they could go away and and do their own research? Yeah, of course. So, first of all, you can take a view on a particular sector, just simply. So, you know, if you've got a a view that, that, for example, you know, in today's market, the energy sector, the global energy sector has been way oversold and you want to take a view on on that, you can invest in the global energy ETF. Yeah, it's called Fuel. Um, if you think, on the other hand, that things are still pretty dodgy, you might want to invest in gold, or you might want to invest in the gold miners ETF, the M- MNRS, the gold miners ETF. We've spoken a lot about taking a view on a downturn using the bear, the bear suite of funds. So I don't need to talk about that. We've got currency-oriented funds for those that want to take a view on on the Australian dollar versus the US dollar as well, and those are currency-oriented ETFs. Some of them are geared, some of them are not. Um, you can take a view on on longer-term secular themes. You know, We see investors interested in themes that really are built for the long term. So we've got, for example, a very popular cybersecurity ETF, HACK, H-A-C-K. You know, that is one where people will say, look, yeah, we're in a tough time at the moment, but cybersecurity is only going to grow and grow and grow. So you know, that is a, you know, a thematic trade. So you've got that. Then for those that are a bit more sophisticated, you know, you could take a view using some sort of a pairs trade. You know, an example might be: let's say you really didn't like the look of the Australian, the Australian uh, share market, but you thought that there was one or two sectors that were really going to stand out. So, let's say, for example, you you really thought the uh, over the long term you didn't like the banks, you didn't like the mining companies, but you thought the, the you know those those emerging Australian technology companies were going to we're going to out, out, you know, outdo them all. So the afterpays or the Appens or uh, uh, you know those types of those types of organisations. So you could, for example, then if you felt that way, you could buy a short fund at the BBOZ fund, and then you could go long the Australian technology sector fund. So you're taking out the the market. You're essentially shorting the market, but you're going long just the Australian technology sector. Um, or you know, finally. You know, you could say, listen, I actually, and these are all just hypothetical. You can, you can, you can sort of see where I'm going with these ideas is, um, you know, you might say, look, actually, Australia has been oversold relative to the U.S. The U.S. has actually now bounced back too much. It looks a little bit overvalued relative to where things are at, whereas the Australian market is still, you know, for example, hypothetically, it still looks like relative value. So then you could go long a leveraged geared fund and you could go short um, a leveraged um, so you could go long a, a leveraged a leveraged Australian shares fund gear, and then you could go long a short US fund, which is BBOS. So essentially, you take you, that's a relative value play on Australia versus the US that way. So those are some some examples that, of course, are highly highly hypothetical. You need to do your own research, but those are some of the things that we see people doing. Of course, but yeah, there's certainly so many opportunities for different ways that you can get creative about how you want to express your ideas with with ETFs and do it all with, you know, just a couple of trades too. Yeah. Ilan, well, I've thoroughly enjoyed having this conversation with you. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some people listening to this who would like to follow along with you. Maybe Twitter is the best place to do. So. Yeah, Twitter, you know, Beta Shares is on Twitter. I'm on Twitter as well. Uh, we're obviously on LinkedIn and we're on Facebook. So we're everywhere, Aaron. So anyone anyone who wants to get a hold of us, they can. And of course, our website, uh, betashares, you know, .com.au, easier to find. And your Twitter handle is? Ilan, I-L-A-N underscore I. All right, we'll leave it there. Until next time, thank you very much, Ilan. We'll chat soon. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders. But rest assured, there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon.
So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes. And we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders. Traders.